This week on the Back Table Podcast. They tend to move around more when they're holding their breath. And then halfway through your run, they take a big, huge breath out and then you've screwed. <laughs> so I just yeah. like kind of let them be who they are, especially when they're under some sedation. They're generally not taking really big, deep breaths. I think another thing that trainees can always remember is glucagon is your friend. If especially big GI bleeds, there often is hypermobility of the bowel. And so if you need to give a little bit of glucagon, I think that's just as helpful as trying to you know do breath holds and, and then you've got that bowel at least reasonably pexied in place for a few minutes as you're doing some runs. So again, I'm a minimalist from that standpoint and, and try to just let the patient breathe shallow breaths like they're doing normally. Always remember looking at these runs, look at them subtracted and unsubtracted. You know, every single one of these runs, you should be looking at both of them just to make sure you're not getting faked out and also that you're not missing anything. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular and interventional. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. Achieving complete and rapid vessel occlusion has never been easy, until now. Introducing Obsidio Conformable Embolic by Boston Scientific. Obsidio Embolic is an FDA-cleared device with shear thinning technology the first embolic of its kind to have a specific on-label indication for peripheral use in the U.S. Delivered in a ready-to-use 1 milliliter syringe, Obsidio Embolic is a pre-mixed aqueous-based solution that starts as an injectable soft solid, flows through the microcatheter as a liquid when force is applied, and returns to a soft solid to occlude the vessel. Obsidio Embolic is quick to deploy, helps the body promote a natural healing response, and ensures confidence like never before in patient outcomes in procedure, and for life. The first ever conformable embolic is here, simply different, simply Obsidio. Visit bostonscientific.com slash Obsidio to learn more. Now, back to the episode. Today we have uh, another very special episode. Uh, We're going to be talking about treatment algorithms and new technologies for GI bleed embolizations. And we've covered this topic in the past. You guys, the audience probably remembers prior episodes with Sabine Don, Michael Baratza, and with Don Garbett, where we've discussed different techniques and tips and tricks on GI bleeds and what people people's different approaches. Today, I've got a special guest, uh, Dr. Kevin Hensler, who's also going to be talking about new innovations in the embolization space, but we're also going to get into his algorithm on how he approaches GI bleeds. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Aaron. It's good to be here. Yeah. And so first thing we'd like to start out with just for our audience is Tell us where you're at, what your practice looks like, maybe a little bit of background about yourself. I date myself by saying my training was at the turn of the century. I did my uh, residency at University of Wisconsin. I'm a proud Badger and grew up in Wisconsin. Then fellowship at Johns Hopkins and then started practice in Minneapolis, St. Paul, right out of fellowship in 2003. So it's been 20 years. And in that 20 years, we have, like is happening in all of healthcare, we're becoming bigger and bigger. And so we started out as a small boutique practice that has gotten bigger and bigger. Right now I'm part of Midwest Radiology, which is 170 or so radiologists. We have about 16 interventionalists, plus or minus. Right now we're down. One of our partners moved to the diagnostic. We have three new partners coming on at the end of their fellowship year. At that point, we'll be at about 17. We cover four bigger hospitals and four smaller hospitals. And so we're in quadrants. So four of us kind of cover a big and a small hospital generally. The good thing about the size of our group and our interventional group is that we're now at the size where we're going to likely be experimenting with an evening shift. So we will have a dedicated interventionalist at 5 o'clock who will work from 5 to 2 and take care of most of what comes through during those times. So as an old guy, I'm excited about getting some call relief. Yeah, Kevin, that's funny. I didn't realize when we first spoke that's how big your group is. My old group, which I still cover for locums, is Texas Radiology Associates. And they're, I think, around 140, 150 general rads, and they have around, I think, 16 IR. So very similar in size. And every every group in Texas boasts to be, you know, one of the biggest in the country and everything. But it sounds like you guys have, have them beat. There's three really big groups in Texas, two of which are in Dallas, I think one in Austin. And so I didn't realize how big you are. And they actually, Texas Radiology Associates, I think in the last year, they switched to that night float system that you're talking about, and they seem much happier. 
Because back when I was covering call, it was 24-7. That is a beat down through a week in a weekend, as you know. Well, as you can imagine, being a Midwest group, we are a bit quieter than the Texas groups about trumpeting how large we are, but we're a very <laughs> large group. Yeah. And we are very much looking forward to testing this evening shift and seeing how it goes. We have, because of the complexity of covering so many hospitals, it's really not a slam dunk. It would be different if it was one or two really big hospitals is all you covered, but because we've got a big geography that we cover, it'll be a challenge, but we're really looking forward to, to seeing if we can make it work. And we got a great group of people that we're working with. As a fellow Midwestern, I'm from Ohio. Yeah, we're not as boastful as, as the Texans, except when it comes to college football. You know, maybe we rival in that case. But all right, well, let's jump into it. Let's talk about GI bleeds. Speaking of call, how do these patients typically present in your practice for our trainees in the audience? You know, where are the typical causes? You we're going to talk more about lower GI bleeds today, but what do you see more of in your practice, upper versus lower? We see more lower GI bleeds. We're certainly asked to consult on lower GI bleeds more often, as we'll probably get into the number of interventions versus consults in lower GI bleed is less than an upper GI bleed when they call us, you know, the percentage of people that we're actually going to do something on is very high. And so when we see those upper GI bleeds, obviously you can you can look at those as either variceal or non-variceal, but talking about the non-variceal bleeds, clearly the duodenal ulcers are the number one things that we're going to see. And we see that with some regularity. The interesting thing about the upper GI bleeds is that those tend to actually be real emergencies. I mean, those people are crashing by the time you're seeing them. They've had their endoscopy They've all had endoscopy first, and the endoscopist either is calling you from the endoscopy suite saying, we really need your help, or had, you know, sculpted them a few hours earlier and put some clips on, and now they're just bleeding again. And so those tend to be a much more emergent case, and it's very satisfying. I One of the things I think that we should keep in mind is those are great cases because you really are, in some cases, saving people's lives. And the endoscopists have all kinds of cool tools just like we do, and they're getting more and more cool tools. And so when you grumble about getting the upper GI bleed call in the middle of the night, be glad that you can be there for that patient. And it may be not too far in the future that we do that less and less as the endoscopists have more and more things to do. So those are pretty straightforward. You know, you're going to get your celiac access. I think, as you've said, you've talked about the techniques on that. The pearls of wisdom I would give is obviously it's important to get past the bleeding source. When we're doing upper GI bleeds, don't forget that you're going to get back bleeding through that pancreatico-duodenal arcade. So don't be happy just to see the bleeding and get a coil kind of in that area. Make sure you get distal to that. I'm coiling all of those and we're coiling presumptively whether we see bleeding or not. Partly because it's the right thing to do. I think the data shows that even if you don't see the bleeding, you have the same outcome, positive outcomes, if you do see the bleeding. But also, you know, you want to get in there, get your coils in there, because if the patient continues to bleed, there's some satisfaction in being able to say, we've done everything, now it's going to be somebody else's turn, as opposed to having you go back in and do the angiograms, which I think happens very rarely. Yeah, you're talking about, you know, coiling across the bleed. It's typically, especially with the GDA, I was just thinking about that. That tends to be probably the biggest coil pack you leave for GI bleed, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and it's interesting because that GDA can be a very big vessel and and usually is a very big vessel. But as you know, when you see active bleeding, often that vessel is very spasmed and you can barely even see what's going on. You get your catheter in there and you kind of got to dug in the vessel before you actually find the bleeding. Yeah. And that that makes me that always makes me concerned when I see that because I know that that vessel is going to relax and you pack your coils in there as soon as that vessel relaxes you are going to recanalize that. And so, you know, I think that's why upper GI bleeding has a much higher rebleed rate and reintervention rate than for instance lower GI bleeding. So, I think that's just something to keep in mind that as long as you can safely get those coils and put as much metal in there as you can because things are going to relax and they're going to change and remodel and that ulcer is still going to be at risk of bleeding even after you high-five your tech because you think you're done. Well, speaking of that, just I want to get into one quick tip for anybody new out there is because you're trying to get as many coils packed in that GDA as possible, do you tend to use detachables in that spot so that you can really kind of pack them in right to the very edge of the hepatic? Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately... Nowadays, I am, uh, I'm so used to the detachables and they are so secure 
that I tend to use detachables for almost everything. Yeah. And I know they're very expensive. And I was at Guest last year and, and there was a panel of old guys my age who kind of shook their heads and said the same thing, which is they know that they really just should do the pushable coils because they're so much cheaper and they're easier and you're going to get it. But the techs are just happy to hand you that detachable coil. And so, and certainly for trainees, for new people, they probably don't have as much experience with pushable. And when you first come out, don't make any mistakes. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about how much your equipment costs. Don't worry about how many catheters end up on the floor. Just do the right thing for the patient and make sure that you're doing it safely. I totally agree. All right, well, let's move on to the lower GI blades. Are there any contraindications to angio and embolization? If somebody's got, you know, renal failure or something like going, I mean, clearly if it's the patient's really bleeding out, it's a dire situation, it's a life and death situation you're proceeding, but is there any kind of contraindication that people should be uh, looking out for before you just take them to the angio suite? I would say that those are all relative contraindications. Certainly having an elevated creatinine, renal failure, renal insufficiency is relative. In these cases, as we talked about, these are generally patients who are really crashing and if they need dialysis after you've saved their life, then that's just yeah. fine. Yeah. Contrast, allergy. These days, I give them a dose of steroids before they come down and consider that covered. And so that's not particularly anything that I'm concerned about. What I do, again, relative contraindications, one of the things I do worry about is when we're asked to embolize a surgical anastomosis. It's not uncommon that people will have gastric bypass and get ulcers at the anastomosis and they will have looked at them endoscopically and they'll tell you this is where the ulcer is. And, you know, I tend to have a very long discussion with the GI and surgery team before I would embolize an anastomosis. Yeah. And with a number of patients, especially in the Midwest, who have gastric surgery, bypass, sleeve, any of those things, I think that is one of the things you got to be very careful about. It's funny, Kevin, you mentioned that because I had that case last week come across our plate in one of the, the Dallas hospitals I work at, and we decided to go conservative, watch and wait, and thankfully the patient stabilized. But the GI doc was kind of pushing for us to do an angio. We ended up doing a CTA, and the CTA was negative. And, you know, we said, hey, let, let's just watch the H&H &H overnight and see how she does. And thankfully, she did fine. My next question is, in your workup, walk us through your lower GI embo kind of work up pre-procedure imaging. Are you pushing for a CTA? Do you know, does it depend on the time of day? When I think about lower GI bleeds, again, these tend to be patients that are generally more hemodynamically stable. They're often patients who have had a scope or who come into the ER and have had some bloody stools and maybe have some soft vital signs. In those cases, I really do want to get a CTA because I think it's really important that I know the vascular territory because often your first couple of angio runs, you're not going to see the bleed. And if you know where to go, you can get your catheter out much further. And for me, what I like to do is a much more aggressive hand injection. And I will often blow whatever clot there was that kept me from seeing the bleeding away if I know where it is. Yeah. And so, you know, in our practice, almost everyone in the lower GI bleed is going to get a CTA. I can't think of many reasons. Even if they're crashing, our IR suite is next to the CT scanner and the extra five minutes it takes to get that information really probably saves me three times that in trying to sub-select. That's true. And so, so from my standpoint, the CTA is important. So, I think one of the things that is important, again, a pearl that I would give is the custody of information is really important in these cases because you'll often get a call from, you know, the GIPA who will say, oh yeah, this person is bleeding. The nurse called and said they're bleeding and we've scoped them and we couldn't find the bleeding. And when you actually talk to the closest person, the patient, which is often the nurse, they'll say, oh yeah, they had some bloody stools three hours ago, you know, at 4 a.m. and it's handoff in nursing rounds and it's 8 a.m. And, and they get that. And so then they call the GI service and said, oh, he's bleeding overnight. And so I think one of the things to do is to always be sure what the value of the information you're getting, because sometimes it's very old information. Yeah. The other thing I like about the CTA is that for me, if the CTA is negative, I'm not doing an angio because I think the overall likelihood of a positive angiogram is going to be very, very small. The difficulty with that is when they've 
have GI bleeding, you get the CTA, it's negative, and then the next day they're bleeding again, then what do you do? Do you keep on getting the CTAs? Do you just say, I'm just going to do the angio and try to figure out what's going on? And I think that's on a per patient basis that you, depends upon the time of the day, where things are. But I think the CTA is, is incredibly valuable. And I think there would be very rare instances that I didn't use all the information I could possibly get. And that's a really valuable piece of information. The tricky thing for me with the CTA is that, you know, you get the CTA and it will be negative and then the GI doc still stops by the department is like, hey, they're still bleeding, you know, it, it might even be right after the CTA, right? And so you're like, ah, but there's not, I don't see anything. And so you don't know, is that, was that just old blood that was in their bowel that they they just pooped out right after the CTA? You know, that's where it gets kind of tricky and that's where we tend to say, okay, Let's do another H and H. Let's trend it, and as long as their vital signs are stable, let's just wait and watch. And that was the case with that case I was talking about last week. Is the GI doc was really pushing us for to do something, and we're like, it's a surgical anastomosis. Like we don't want to embolize unless we absolutely have to, you know. And I think one of the other things that I think we should keep in mind is that we should be treating patients, not images. We all hear that in training, but you know, there's positive CTAs that are subtle for bleeding that I have found, you know, over the last five years, a CT has gotten really, really good. That even when I see a positive bleed and I know exactly where the vessel is, you know, there's 50%, 25% of the time I go in there and I still don't see the bleed because it's just, the CT is so sensitive. And, you know, we have to remember that whatever it is, 80 or 90% of these GI bleeds are going to stop on their own. And so if the patient's really doing well, and even if the CT scan is positive, sometimes you say, let's just watch things. And if they continue to bleed, I've got a source and I'll definitely go in. But if the patient's doing well, clinically stable, we know that there's some bleeding, but we knew there was bleeding because they're pooping blood. So we know there's some bleeding and we have, a, we have a target if we need to. Let's wait to see if this will resolve itself versus me going in and, and flailing around. The other thing that I think is helpful from a pearl standpoint is, at least for me, I use for most of these, I'm going to use a Glide SIM catheter. And I can get that Glide Sim catheter out into the iliocolic artery if I want to. I can get it really, really far out. And getting a five French catheter really far out gets you a really, really good injection. And if you can't do that, then a larger micro catheter, because I think it's really critical that you distend that vessel that is the target vessel, because you're going to miss the bleed if you're not giving that a really, a relatively aggressive injection. So that was my next question is approach. It sounds like if you're using a, a SIM, then it's probably femoral. Correct. Are you, have you, are, you, are you ever doing radial approach for GI bleeds? Not really. The way that I look at it, first of all, I don't do a lot of PVD in my practice. And so I think you got to do enough radial access that you're good at it. Yeah. And I have an, an awful lot of experience in the groin and not as much in the wrist. And so I'm just as comfortable in the groin than the wrist. Now, a UFE or something like that, wrist access would be something I'd consider but in these patients, they're kind of flailing around. You're, I don't see that as a great case for a wrist unless you are incredibly, if you're really, really facile with radial access, you know, you, you go at it. But if, again, if you're new, these patients tend not to be cooperating very well. And so I think that groin access is just fine. Yeah. I mean, that tends to be the case. The people I know who approach these with radial are people who that's was just part of their training, right? They did a lot of radio at like Sinai or someplace, you know, like that. And so they're just as comfortable with radio as they are in with femoral. I, I'm not because I didn't do a lot of radio in training. And like you said, femoral just is how I'm used to. I've done pretty much every GI bleed femoral. So it, would, it wouldn't make any sense for me to go radio unless there was like just such a crazy angle. I couldn't get anything and, and the patient's really dire straits. Then I, I might try it from above. So let's talk about, so you mentioned your catheter of choice. You said glide wider as well. Is that what you're typically using to get access? I would start with the Benson just to get into the vessel and get it engaged. And then I would get my glide wire quite a ways out into the vascular arcade so that I can get my glide cap as distal as I think I need it to be. Yeah. So assuming that you know where the source is, you know, it's a SMA territory. Let's say you accidentally pop in the IMA. Are you, are you going to do an IMA run? If you know it's SMA territory on the CTA? Um, that's a good question. It depends upon <laughs> which way the coin flips, whether it's a head or a tail. If I see the bleed on CT and it's an SMA bleed and I find the bleed and I embolize it, 
The textbook would tell you, well, you still need to do your celiac and your IMA run. Sometimes I forget to read the textbook and I might just say, that's fine. If it slips into the IMA, absolutely, I'm going to do that without a question. Or if I'm concerned or there's been something else going on with a patient that makes me think that we should check for something else. But generally, my rule of thumb is get out of the vessel as soon as you can. I don't like screwing around inside the vessels. I think that's just the next thing you're going to do is you're going to dissect the IMA trying to get into it and, and that you haven't done anybody any good. Even worse. Right. So I tend to, to try to minimize the time that I spend in the vessels and generally wouldn't, as a matter of course, look at every single vessel unless there's an indication. I totally agree. And, you know, as you know, most of these patients with the lower GI bleeds are elderly and their IMA is minuscule or just completely occluded already. And so it just doesn't make it sense even to try because on the CTA, they're, it doesn't look like you're going to get in with any kind of catheter, you know, especially if you see it on the SMA. And it, like you said, it's coiled, it's done, like you should just get out of there, I think. And one of the things I think that you bring up is also don't underestimate the value of that CTA. And sometimes, especially when it's two in the morning, you're at home, you turn on your computer, you see the bleed, you call your team, you go in and you can forget to look, you know, what the iliacs look like? What does the femoral look like? Which side are you going to be going on? Is there a replaced right hepatic if you're doing, you know, if you're going to do a middle, a middle colic embolization so that you know where your anatomy is? So certainly take time to look at those other things. Don't just say, okay, there's a positive GI bleed. I'm going to go in because you can end up wishing you had spent 30 seconds reviewing everything before you go in. Yeah. And, and like you said, the CTA is a diagnostic exam that you just got 30 minutes before. If there's no bleed in the IMA distribution, then why are you mucking around with it? You know, just because it's, we are trained that way or hardwired that way, right. you know, from training, it doesn't make any sense practically and it, it, it can hurt the patient. And I would even say that part of that is that when I trained, you had to look at all those vessels because we didn't have. Right. I mean, we had to find the bleeding. And so you weren't ever sure where <laughs> the bleeding was. So you had to find anything. Now we're in a different, it's a different world. Real quick question. What is your typical injection rate for the SMA? So I do hand injections for all of these. And again, it's just, it's a time in the vessel. It's, I feel very comfortable doing that. I can control it. So I'm not stepping out and doing power injections. Got it. And you're, are you trying to get them to hold their breath to reduce that respiratory motion? Actually, generally not. I think that holding their breath, they tend to move around more when they're holding their breath. And then halfway through your run, they take a big, huge breath out and then you've screwed. <laughs> so I just yeah. like kind of let them be who they are, especially when they're under some sedation. They're generally not taking really big, deep breaths. I think another thing that trainees can always remember is glucagon is your friend. If Especially big GI bleeds, there often is hypermobility of the bowel. And so if you need to give a little bit of glucagon, I think that's just as helpful as trying to you know, do breath holds. And, and then you've got that bowel at least reasonably pexied in place for a few minutes as you're doing some runs. So again, I'm a minimalist from that standpoint and, and try to just let the patient breathe shallow breaths like they're doing normally. That's a good tip. That's a great tip. To end that is also always remember looking at these runs, look at them subtracted and unsubtracted. Yeah. You know, every single one of these runs, you should be looking at both of them just to make sure you're not getting faked out and also that you're not missing anything. On that, you know, we've talked about this before in the show. I was always trained to take your gloves off, go out and sit down in the control room and look at the proper images instead of like trying to stand there and look through your fogged up glasses. I know you, you mentioned that you like to make it speedy. Let's keep the case going, get in and out as fast as possible. What's your take on that? So my take is my advice would be that before you are done, you should take your gloves off and look at everything, especially if you've had a negative angiogram. I think that's important. I'm doing everything in the suite. I'm not taking my gloves off and I'm not going back and looking. And I'm also, I think the other thing that, again, is a pearl for trainees is you often have people standing next to you who have been doing this for 20 years. I always say, does anyone see anything? Yeah. And 75% of the time, people will say, hey, yeah, yeah, I see something. You're like, okay, no, that's not that. That's something different. But then you're you're looking at it and you're walking through it and you're making sure that that's in fact not it. But 25% or 10% of the time, someone's going to say, I see that. And you look at it and you're like, oh, yeah, maybe that is something. And you might do another obliquity or do something else. So it's a good time to be humble when you're in these cases and ask for help. And your techs have lots of experience and they're not perfect and they don't have the knowledge base that you have, but they have eyeballs and experience. And so use that. Yeah, you're right. They, they have seen many a GI bleed. Sometimes they've seen a lot more than you have. And it is good to have, like you said, an extra pair of eyeballs looking through those images. 
What happens if you don't see a bleed? Do you ever do anything provocative? We've, we've done episodes talking about that before. I know it's kind of a new thing, but... I would be on the wimpy end of that spectrum. <laughs> um, I, I'm certainly not going to put TPA in. Heparin, I would consider in situations, and I've done it a couple of times. I like it because you can reverse it if you need to, or if all of a sudden you've got five bleeding sources and, and you're getting overwhelmed. One thing that I think is helpful is nitroglycerin. I mean, these vessels often are, again, have vasospasm when they're bleeding. So if you have a negative and you really know where it is, some nitroglycerin can go a long way to opening the vessel and seeing that bleed. And that's a fairly low risk medication to be giving a patient. And that's, you know, as long as their pressures are okay. Yeah. With a short half-life. Yeah. That, I'm on the wimpy side too. I don't, I can't go do what Sabine does with the TPA and everything. It just nitros as far as I've gone. And I think I agree with you. It should help open up those vessels and only in the case where, you know, the CTA shows there's something in that area. Then I'd be like, okay, let's put some nitro in here. Uh, and especially if they're hypotensive, right? You know, you know, those vessels are going to clamp down. And one of the things also, I think when you're having that calculus is where are you? Because, you know, a lot of these, so I like to say you bloom where you grow. I'm in a outer rim hospital. That's a pretty good size. It's almost 500 bed hospital. Our general surgeons are good but they don't want this patient crashing because you gave them TPA and you can't control the bleeding or there's multiple sources and you're going to burn bridges doing that. Whereas if you're in an academic center and you've got the chief surgical resident sitting outside the window and giving you the thumbs up to do that, that's just a completely different place to do it. And so you've got to be careful, you know, where you are and what kind of support you have. And you don't want to be a cowboy and then have a bunch of people look at you and say, you know, look what you made me do. I know I had to open this guy's belly and I don't know where the bleeding is and I'm going to do a hemicolectomy and he's going to get an ostomy and, and you haven't really helped anybody. All good points. All good points. So let's get into the meat of it with, in terms of embolization devices. We've talked a fair amount previously on the show about detachable coils. We've talked about glue. Actually, Zeev Haskell was on the show talking about glue. And you're going to kind of help talk about a new product that's soon to be on the market. And But at first, I, before we get into the new stuff, I want you to tell me kind of what's been your traditional go-to uh, embolization device for lower GI bleeds. Clearly coils. You know, you hear or you see some research about particles, which makes me kind of cringe because I'm just so concerned about end organ damage of the colon and causing ischemia. So for me, it's, it's always coils. Glue, I'm not a gluer. It's interesting, when I went through fellowship, that was the time where people were gluing catheters in place. And so glue was very, very high risk. And so we just didn't do very much glue. And I think as Ziv said, I listened to that. It was a great, if you have any desire to do glue, you should by all means listen to it. It's a must listen. But I think he's right. It's not to be trifled with. And so if you have glue in your training and you are very comfortable with glue, I would work hard to keep that skill set up because once you lose it, or if you didn't get it, getting the experience with glue is, is a very, very tough road. And so if you've got it, try to keep it. And if you don't have it, you know, you got to be careful about trying to learn with glue because it's very operator dependent. There's a lot of variability. What dilution am I going to use? Am I going to have glue stuck on the end of the catheter that's going to embolize? God forbid, am I going to, you know, glue my catheter in place? So I tend not to use glue for me. Uh, a lower GI bleed is a coil, a coil, and a coil. That's really all I'm going to use. And de detachable, like you said before, with the upper GI. Although there are times where when you are, if you can get very, very far out into the vasorecta, I'll put in just like a... Two millimeter halal or two something. Two millimeters straight yeah. coil. Yes, exactly. And and those are great cases and you're done and you're out. I love those. Those are my favorite. Those little, and you can just kind of shoot them in with a little syringe. So let's talk a little bit about this new embolization product that's coming on the market here shortly called Obsidio. Just give our audience a little bit of background about the product and, and how you became kind of involved with it. So I live in Minneapolis, which is the headquarters of lots of endovascular companies, Medtronic, Boston Scientific has a big presence here. So one of the opportunities here is to be able to partner with industry a little bit and help them with some with work. And so I we also have one of the largest animal labs in the country in Minneapolis. And so I dabble in some preclinical work doing animal labs. And so I was doing some work and was evaluating this product. And it was part of a group of products I was evaluating. And the, the CEO, after we were done, reached out to me and said, I'm looking for some help in 
continuing to formulate this product and, and working with it, would you be willing to do that? And I said, yes, of course. And so it was a product that was already formed, but needed some tweaking. And so we did iterations where, you know, you talk about glue, glue is adhesive. It's sticking to things. Obsidio is an injectable solid, and I will maybe get into that a little bit more, but it's more cohesive. It sticks to itself. And so we would go through iterations saying, this isn't sticking enough to itself, or this has now become too sticky too. So we worked through iterations of that. And then I ended up working with the preclinical and FDA approval process, getting all the animal research for the indications of hemorrhage and, and hypervascular tumor. And so have quite a bit of, you know, probably have injected it in several hundred arteries. And the company was purchased by Boston Scientific. And Boston Scientific, I believe, intends to have the market launch of the product fairly soon. So that's my background with it. But, but what is it? Obsidio is not a liquid embolic. So when we've been talking about glue, we're talking about liquid embolics. When we talk about onyx, we're talking about a liquid embolic with Obsidio, it's an injectable solid. So what it is, is it's like peanut butter in a 1cc syringe. It's very, very thick and viscous. But when put under pressure, it flows like a liquid. And so it can go through a small microcatheter. And then once it exits the microcatheter, it moves back to that solid state. So the physical properties of Obsidio are such that it is not going to flow very, very distally like a dilute glue would. It would function much more like a more thick, viscous glue material. It's going to generally stay near the tip of the catheter. But if there's a high flow vessel, some of it will shear off. It, it will go distally. Or if you're injecting it very, very slowly, you can have the blood supply move it very distally and kind of fill up an entire vascular bed. It kind of reminds me of cement from with kyphoplasties, right? I mean, just the way you're describing it, PMMA, does it have that sort of like toothpaste-y kind of consistency? Exactly. You'll inject it when you, when you see it, uh, when your rep comes and shows it to you, you'll put it on your finger and it's just like that. It's, it's kind of like that toothpaste or peanut butter, very, very viscous, thick material. But the genius of it is that biomechanical ability to have it flow and be a fluid when it's under pressure in your microcatheter. Got it. And what that means is that it's very controllable because as soon as you stop adding the pressure, then everything stops. Everything is in, is in place. There's no adhesion. So it could sit in your catheter for as long as you wanted to do. And then you can continue the embolization. Okay. One of the things that I think is interesting about the material and exciting is that we just talked a little bit about glue and about kind of the high risk but high reward of glue and, and how much you have to be really well trained in it because bad things can happen. I think that that Obsidio is a product that de-risks that a little bit where it's going to be something that people after two or three times using it are going to start to feel pretty comfortable with with how it works and when they're going to use it. You know, lower GI bleed, we like to think about this in, in a smaller vascular bed, maybe vessels less than three millimeters. And so I think it's going to be a great product in GI bleeds and a lower GI bleed. It is catheter agnostic, which is nice. One of the things that's, that's a little bit frustrating is, you know, some of the detachable coils they use, you're supposed to use the, the products design catheter and, and that's not always the catheter you want to use. So that's another advantage. So there's some real advantages. And I think in these kind of situations, we're going to learn more. And it's not just Obsidio. There's going to be a lot more coming out. There's a lot coming out in the liquid embolic market. And I just said Obsidio is not a liquid embolic. But in that whole market basket, a lot is coming out. And I think it's going to be really important for everybody, new and old interventional radiologists, to understand what these products do, which products you think you're going to want to invest your time into learning. Because let's just say a year from now, there are four or five different materials like this you can't get good at them all. And so you're going to have to figure out which ones, which ones do you want to invest the time? I think Obsidio is going to be, is going to be well positioned in there. It's got some advantages for coils in that you can be anticoagulated. It's, it's just filling, it's physically filling the vessel lumen. And so one of the, is it permanent? It is permanent. One of the things that's always, is it radio opaque? It is. There's tantalum in it. 
the tantalum is pre-mixed. It's microlyzed tantalum so that you will be able to see it. It is not as dense as onyx. And so there's not as much beam hardening artifact. And so you get a CT and you'll see it in place, but it won't be this big starburst. Another advantage. But with the anticoagulation, there you can use it in anticoagulated patients. As you know, coils really are frustrating in anticoagulated patients, even patients on Plavix and aspirin, which almost all of these patients, not with their lower GI and their upper GI bleeds, they're all on aspirin and Plavix. And so this is going to help, and it may end up being an adjuvant. To, you put one coil in, and then you put some obsidio behind it in an anticoagulated patient, and you've got yourself a very secure embolization. So Sabine got to trial it actually yesterday, and I was messaging with him because I was asking our team of hosts for questions about the new product. And um, Sabine said, quote unquote, really cool game changer. And he said, very easy to use. They just did a demo like on the back table. But he, he was saying, even though it just said multiple times, it's not a liquid embolic. He said best of onyx and best of glue. It takes away the annoying stuff from both of them. But he does have some specific questions for you. He wanted to know, does the product extra, like if there's frank bleeding extra, like a large bleed, you did mention that this has been for small vessels at this point, but is there in the animal studies, have you ever seen product extract into the space or into the GI space when maybe too much is injected or anything like that? We haven't. Again, because it is it cohesive, so even though it will get out to, and I can't quote offhand into the, you know, 30 or, or 60 micron range. Yeah. It it is not liquid, so it is not going to extravasate out into now if it did i don't expect that there'd be a problem because we have animal data six months out that just shows that in the vessel there's remodeling and the tantalum is left and it's a gelatin base and so that all goes away so even if it did move out into the lumen or or, or extravascular i don't think that's an issue it's an inert ingredient with four it's got it's got four ingredients and none of them are are toxic in any way so that shouldn't be an issue does it need to be refrigerated Again, and that's one of the geniuses of the product, and I didn't develop this product, so I'm not taking any credit for that. One of the geniuses of the product, you just take it off the shelf. They recommend storing it refrigerated. It has a shelf life out of the refrigerator several weeks to months, and they're working on how far out it can be out of the refrigerator. But if you have it in your refrigerator in your lab and you just hold it in your hand and warm it up for 30 seconds, that's really all you need to do, and then it's ready to go. It is in the syringe. It is all mixed up. It is one of the nice things about this in something like a GI bleed. Some of the other things we've talked about, you know, Onyx clearly is not a great product for this because you've got a huge prep. And some of that could happen as you're getting things ready, but probably not terribly practical. Glue, well, not taking as long. It is a little bit more fussy when someone's bleeding out. This is, you just have the, the tech opens the package, they hand it to you, you put it on your catheter and you're done. One of the things I love about it is you can see it because of tantalum. You know that when it fills the vessel that you've occluded it. And so, for instance, you've got, let's say, a lumbar artery or a, or a lower GI bleed that you see. You ask your tech for the obsidio. You put it on your catheter. You fill the vessel, and it might take 0.1 cc to fill a vessel. Wow. Not often 0.2 cc's. And then you pull your your microcatheter out and you're done. And we're talking, you know, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, less than it takes to prep and get your coils in. So it's it's a really fantastic product with a lot of upside. Downside is that, you know, it's sitting inside your microcatheter. So unlike a coil, you're not able to do a run after you have injected this. Certainly, as we get more and more experience with that, there's no reason that you can't use a sandwich technique in this and put a you know, 0.1 millimeter, milliliter in, and then keep your lumen open. But right now, that's there's not a lot of data on that. So to be on the safe side, you're injecting it. And then if you've got three or four different spots, that may not be the perfect solution. But if you can find the bleeding, it's it's a great, very quick, and very sure. You just, you take your gloves off, you high five the techs, and you're out. Well, I guess you could have a 2 on and do an injection through your base, right? If you have your microcatheter, Yes, absolutely. You can do that. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, for example, glue on the Ziv Haskell episode, we were wondering, Ali Bahedi, who was the host of that, she pointed out that Ziv suggested portal vein embo for like a first case kind of, for somebody who's just starting out using glue for embolization. 
what do you think for Obsidio going forward as this product comes to market would be for somebody using it for the first time? Would it be a lower GI bleed in this case, or is there something else that you theorize would be a good first case for, for new users? I think a great first case for Obsidio would be your run-of-the-mill lumbar or inferior epigastric bleed where you have an appropriately sized vessel, you have relatively straightforward anatomy, and I think that that's the case where you can really see what the material can do in a very safe area. So I like I like it for those, you know, for small trauma muscular bleeds, those kind of things. One of the things that I would just caution people with this new product, we talk about vessels less than three millimeters or three millimeters and less for a reason, and that is this does interact with the wall of the vessel and in vessels that are prone to spasm, you can spasm with this material in. And as you can imagine, as we've talked about, this is like toothpaste. And if you have the vessel filled up all the way to its origin and then it spasms, you can spasm the material outside and get some misembolization. When you think about, well, what are the first cases I'm going to do? Those are some of the things that I think you should consider is, you know, how safe is my access? Do I have, do I have enough space? I don't want to do this right before a critical branch vessel or anything like that. But I think those, the trauma, the renal traumas, the spontaneous retroperitoneal bleeds, I think those are going to be great first cases for Obsidio. And I'm never sure if I'm right about this, but we talk about a steep learning curve, but I believe that actually a steep learning curve, we think that means that it takes a long time or it's hard, but a steep learning curve is what you want, which means it's really easy to get up to proficiency. The quicker you can get to proficiency is the steeper your learning curve. And I think this is a very steep learning curve. It's going to take you one or two cases and you're going to go, oh yeah, okay, I got this. Or even as you talk about Sabine, just even at the back table, you're going to get a really good feel about, you know, what is this doing? And and I think that's one of the things that make it very easy to approach as a new product. Yeah. As you were talking, I was thinking about the renal trauma is also a great example, I think too, because like those are typically tend to be small pseudoaneurysms that are, you know, and you're, you're trying to get real sub-segmental as you can. But yeah, those are, I mean, the epigastric, that's a great example, I think, too. Yeah, and as the product has more use and there is limited human data, I mean, there, this is a lot of, of great lab data, but that's going to come quickly. And it's interesting to see. I think that this will be something that people will be really interested for endo leaks. I think there's lots of other things that are off-label, you know, as interventional radiologists, we look at the instructions for use once and then throw them away and forget about them. And so we will continue to do that as we have always done. And I think there's a lot of interesting uses for the product that will be, they'll be coming forward. But, but again, I think one of the things just to keep in mind is this will not be the only product coming out. There will be others. And it's going to be important to kind of figure out where you're going to invest your time which of all of these new products you're going to have to decide which products do I think that are going to work well in my armamentarium? How am I going to use them? Which ones are the most versatile and the safest and easiest for me to learn? And I think that Obsidio ticks a lot of those boxes. So what I've heard is May to June, there's going to be 100 human cases in 30 centers and then a limited market release after that. So that's exciting. I mean, that's really next month that we're looking at. I imagine yours will be one of those centers. Yeah. Again, I've been able to use it in the lab a lot and feel very, very comfortable with it. And I, I'm excited about the prospects of a new tool in our toolbox. And, you know, again, as an old guy like me, learning new tricks is kind of fun. It's fun. I mean, fun at any stage, I think. It's what keeps us going. That's why we chose IR, right? It's always something new almost every year, it seems like. Well, Kevin, we could talk a little bit about post-procedure care just to kind of go A to Z with the G lower GI bleeds. What's your typical post-procedure care for, for these folks after an embolization? Generally, post-embolization, depending upon their hemodynamic stability and the time of day, I may leave a sheath in. If they're unstable and they don't have an art line, I leave a sheath in. And especially at two in the morning when they've been, if I'm coming in at two in the morning, they're probably relatively sick. And so I generally leave the sheath in overnight, make sure that they have monitoring and have some great access if they need it. Otherwise, I'll close the groin. Again, these patients tend not to be just sitting around quietly. There's a lot of moving and shaking and a lot of changing bedpans. And so I think in these patients, a good closure device du jour 
whatever you're comfortable with is good. There's a, our neurointerventionalists are using a new device called the CELT device. Yes. It's hot on the market right now. I've deployed a couple of those with them. Again, high risk, high reward. If it works, it's pretty cool. I'm a little concerned if it doesn't. But so, I, you know, we close the groin. They're going to head up to the ICU. And from my standpoint, you know, our service will round on them, check on how they're doing, but nothing specifically that I'm going to do post-procedural care. I'm going to leave that to my medicine colleagues who are much happier to do that than I am. If not a cell, is it like a minx or an angio seal? What do you, what do you guys like have on the shelf? My two favorite are I use the per close and I use the star close. Those are the two that I tend to use most often and just kind of depends upon the vessel and, and how it looks. The per close is a, is a great device. And, and so, especially if there's, if they're on antiplatelets or, or if they're moving around a lot, I'm feeling pretty comfortable that when I cinch that knot down around my wire and I got nothing coming around it, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to have a good closure. And so that's really one of the nice things about that. So in these, I would tend to probably per close them. Okay. Well, fantastic. Any final thoughts, Kevin, before we wrap up? It's been a lot of great information. No, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate the work you're doing. Whenever I have to brush up on something that's coming on, whether it's I haven't done a tips in a while or I got a varicocele embolization on the schedule, I often go into the back table archives and, <laughs> and lean on people much smarter than I am. So I appreciate the service you're doing. And it's, it's a lot of fun to listen to you guys. Well, thanks, Kevin. It is great that we have these archives now because we look back and it's for over 300 episodes. I'm like, man, we now the challenge is trying to make that information more accessible, right? So that you're not digging for that content that you really need that day. That's my next sort of stage is trying to figure out a way, some sort of AI algorithm for you to just be like, hey, I want to tips university. Where is it? You know, bring it up right now. Because you're right, there's tons of great, I mean, we've had so many great people on, some of which we've mentioned today, Ziv Haskell. You know, we, we just had Fritz Angle talking about adrenal vein sampling last weekend. Can't wait for that one to come out. That's one where you always need a refresher, right? Right. <laughs> like, I don't know people who do that on a weekly basis where it's like top of mind. It's just, I need, anytime that case comes up, I need to go over either an article, but I liked the fact that we have podcasts now that you can listen to on your way to work. So it works out. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate your time and all the intel that you provided. Can't wait to hear more about Obsidio and, and get our hands on it. If our audience has any questions for you, uh, is there a good way to get in touch with you? I can leave you an email and uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, those would be two areas to, uh, to be able to get a hold of me if you have any questions. Perfect. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kennebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Mood. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 